today as we mark Bethel's 250th uh, anniversary, the anniversary of the, uh, of the founding of the town, the granting of Bethel at Sudbury, Canada, which uh, uh, has always led to all sorts of questions and all sorts of stories about how we were the line, the, you know, the Canadian line changed and we were once in Canada and, uh, you know, our connection, our strong connection with Sudbury, Ontario, and of course there's absolutely no connection with Sudbury, <laughs> Ontario, so we can tell you what it's, what it's not. Uh, in 1996, uh, we celebrated the 200th anniversary of Bethel's Incorporation with parades and exhibits and all sorts of things, and for any of you that haven't noticed, on every sign welcoming you to Bethel, and there are a lot of them, whether it's a chamber sign or the town sign, it says incorporated in 1796. Mm. Uh, I think it's important to remember that the town existed before then as Sudbury, Canada. There were houses here, there were people here, mills here, uh, and uh, settled permanently <coughs> in 1774, but granted in 1768. So I, I have always thought that this, you know, this is a, an important date, but it's one that we don't tend uh, to focus on. Uh, fortunately, the societies. Uh, always looking for anniversaries. <laughs> uh, so this is a, a good, a good uh, a hook, as we say. Uh, uh, although Bethel was established 250 years ago, its origins can be traced back to 1690. The massive invasion fleet Sir William Phipps uh, led in hopes of conquering Quebec. Uh, little known in the United States, but an iconic moment in Canada. The invasion was one of the worst military disasters in American history led by a treasure-hunting knight with no military experience. The failed expedition plunged Massachusetts deeply into debt, and when we have bus tours in here, I always remind people, and you all know this, this house was built in 1813 in Massachusetts. <laughs> the museum we own next door was built in 1821 in Maine, and they both never moved. You would think about <laughs> uh, uh, and it, The uh, expedition helped trigger the Salem Witch Tribes, and uh, Tad has brought uh, his great book, A Storm of Witchcraft, now available uh, in soft cover. So if you don't have a copy of that, I know you'd enjoy it. Uh, ultimately, it led to the establishment of Canada Township along the New England frontier. This included Sudbury, Canada, present day Bethel, which was granted to the survivors and heirs of the soldiers of the 1690 campaign who resided in Sudbury, Massachusetts. Dr. Emerson Tad Baker is a professor of history, interim dean of graduate professional studies at Salem State University. Uh, Tad has visited us a number of times. We're always happy when he can come back. He has a busy schedule, we know, and appreciate his presence today. Award-winning author of many works on the history and archaeology of early Maine and New England, including A Storm of Witchcraft, The Salem Trials, and the American Experience. He's also co-author of The New England Knights, Sir William Phipps. Uh, 1651 to 1695, which I'm told today is now out of print, so I'm glad I have a copy. Baker has served as an advisor for the PBS TV uh, American Experience and Colonial House. This summer has appeared on two episodes of TLC's Who Do You Think You Are? He's also the project scholar for the Old Berwick Historical Society's current exhibit, Forgotten Frontier, Untold Stories of the Scatterquark. Uh, and uh, so would you all please join me in giving a warm Bethel Sudbury Canada welcome to Emerson Tad Baker. <laughs> so, thank you, Randy. It's uh, great to be here. Even with that, that wrong turn I took and ended up in Canton, coming across, <laughs> took the, went the wrong way on 140. I was panicked. Um, a couple of things. First off, it is interesting, Randy, isn't it? The way these, these, these dates crop up and anniversaries and very, yes, it is a great time for us to, to celebrate anniversaries, but also how they get them wrong. You know, I, I live in York and in York, they, uh, back in 2002, they wanted to celebrate the 350th anniversary of incorporation of the town of York. Uh, and I pointed out to them that the town had actually been settled uh, almost 20 years, 20, 20 years earlier uh, and had not been part of Massachusetts, and that the 1652 anniversary that they were celebrating was when, uh, when the province of Maine had a, shall we say, a hostile takeover 
by Massachusetts Bay, and that the people who actually lived there in 1652 would, were, would have been spinning in their graves if we actually were to celebrate the incorporation of the town, where they changed the name and changed the government and all kinds of other nasty stuff. So, you know, it's, this, this incorporation in Massachusetts, uh, I have some trouble with it, Randy, so. Um, and also, too, um, I, I'm, I'm delighted to, to see my, well, my, well, I say, friend of many years, uh, Stan Howe here, and I'm, and I'm honored to be giving the, 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 the Stanley Howe lecture this year. It's, uh, it's, it's good to see you. Um, so uh, I think originally Randy had, had envisioned maybe like a whole, whole day symposium on this. And so in some ways, I'm like ended up though kind of combining maybe two or three talks into one. Uh, and sort of, you know, Sir William Phipps, the expedition of 1690, and also Sudbury, Canada. Uh, but I also, as I, was, as I was developing the talk, I was thinking, you know, really, maybe what it should be titled is, is, is connecting local history to the bigger picture. Because to me, that's what we're, we're really all about, and that is what makes places like the Bethel Historical Society so wonderful, is that, that you, you are the, 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 that memory house for local history, but also that local history is, is all part of these bigger patterns, this bigger picture. So yes, today we'll, we'll talk about the origins, we'll just get to the starting point of Bethel, but we're gonna connect it to some, some really big events in American history, uh, as Randy has, uh, has suggested. So it'll be a bit of a whirlwind, and uh, I'm, I'm free to, an I'm, I'll answer any questions afterwards, because, and, and as I best I know, but if I don't, there are experts in the audience who can answer them, I know. Um, so, just to start, let's imagine a hypothetical situation here. Imagine we have a powerful political leader who comes to office with absolutely no political experience. Now, as a young man, he comes to the country, uh, from, or to, the, to the big city uh, from the country, to make his fortune. But he has a, actually a head start, it turns out, from his, from his family. Um, he becomes one of the richest men in America by taking big risks, winning and losing. He's a deal maker, he's incredibly famous, has a huge larger than life personality. His late conversion to his political cause makes, though, makes some of his supporters suspicious. But he champions the cause of the working class and seems to come out okay. Once in office, his style makes people rather nervous. He's, he's an unconventional communicator with a salty tongue. He doesn't play by the rules. He's accused repeatedly of conflict of interest of being self-serving in office, of helping out himself and his family. And this quickly gets him into legal problems. He's abusive to, to his subordinates and absolutely demands their loyalty. He shows irrational support for our mortal enemies. And before long, the cry of witch hunt comes to the fore. Now by, sure, by now, I'm sure you all know that I'm, of course, think, referring to Sir William Phipps, <laughs> the first royal governor of Massachusetts. Sir William Phipps, the New England Knight, first American rags to riches story. In fact, uh, that, that, that famous concept of, of rags to riches and pulling oneself up by the bootstraps as made famous by Samuel Smiles in his book, Self Help. He actually uses as an example, his example of this, young William Phipps, for he is the first man to salvage a Spanish treasure galleon. That also, by the way, makes him the, the patron saint of treasure hunters. Um, he's the first American to be knighted by the King of England. He's the leader of two invasions of Canada. He's the first royal governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony and also governor during the Salem Witch Trials. That's a, that's a pretty impressive accomplishment for a guy who was borderline illiterate and was also, again, known for his use of bad language. Um, fascinating, fascinating guy, and I keep on waiting for the movie to be made. As a matter of fact, uh, when my friend John Reed and I uh, wrote the book on him, uh, we maintained the movie rights because we just think there's such an amazing story there. <laughs> he's so famous, and today he's, you know, again, to, to folks like Randy and I, he's, he's a, a kind of a, a bit of a cult hero, but uh, he really has kind of a, become obscure, right? But uh, he, he was so famous in his day that two years after he died, the first biography of him was published. Um, and of course, it's published by, by Cotton Mather, his political friend and ally, and as I would say, actually his, his spin doctor, in a bit, uh, in, in, in 1697. 
Um, so, because yes, they had spin doctors back then, only they didn't call them that. Um, clearly, Mather's account is highly embellished. It's an account of a, of a poor boy who he calls, you know, a, a young shepherd tending his sheep uh, on what he called a despicable plantation in Maine. Uh, uh, clearly, you know, a, a boy who had made it good from incredibly humble origins. And therein, of course, is the lesson of the sermon that Reverend Cotton Mather wants you to hear. Um, if you've read much Cotton Mather, though, you'd realize that sometimes Mather might be known to stretch the truth a bit to make a point. So, in fact, when John Reed and I did write uh, the biography, The New England Night, uh, which, yes, is sadly out of print, Randy, uh, we, you know, uh, but the good news is nowadays, thanks to, uh, thanks to uh, Alivris and bookfinder.com and places like that and eBay, there's always seem to be copies floating around, many of them mysteriously unread. So I don't understand why people would buy this book and not read it, because um, it is an amazing story. Anyhow, um, our efforts were to try to sort of set the record straight, to see if we could separate where we could uh, the myth from, from legend. And so I want to first talk about Sir William Phipps, which will lead into the expedition of 1690 uh, and play out the, the story of, of the, in some ways, that origin story of Sudbury, Canada, right? So first off, supposedly Sir William, again, was from this typical West Country family. It was the West Countrymen from Cornwall and Devon and Somerset who were the first settlers of the coast of Maine in the 1620s and 30s and 40s coming here in large part to, to ply their trade as, 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 as fishermen, uh, trading with the Native Americans. And in this case, Sir William's father, James Phipps, is uh, a blacksmith, in fact, a gunsmith, who migrates from Mangotsfield in, in Gloucestershire, which is actually a suburb of Bristol, the major west port of, of England. And you can see here what appears to be, what, what actually looks like it's out in the country, but if you go there today and you can visit the church, you're in the urban sprawl of Bristol, which of course is really is the second leading city of, of, of England, uh, and it's sort of been overwhelmed, and it's no longer sort of that rural farmland that it would have been when James Phipps was, was, was raised there. Um, but James is an early, uh, early immigrant uh, to Pemaquid, Maine, and uh, his services as a blacksmith would have been in very much demand, particularly as a gunsmith, because when you have guns and hardware imported from England, uh, once it breaks, it's a long time to get something from England. It'll take you probably a year before you'll see it again. So it's a good occupation to have. Um, and after a few years when he's, of serving his indenture, um, Phipps moves to nearby to Woolwich, Maine, where he establishes again what Cotton Mather will refer to as a despicable plantation, uh, where he establishes his farm, um, his trading post, uh, operating his blacksmithing operations. But bear in mind that in the time, in the 1630s and 1640s, the family are at the far edge of the frontier up here. Uh, Pemaquid is the northern and easternmost settlement, English settlement in Maine, in New England, in the 1600s. Uh, may explain one reason why the Colonial Pemaquid State Park is there today because it was constantly being destroyed in, in wars, right? Um, so it was a very, very much a precarious place, and living a few miles west in Woolwich was, was precarious as well, a place of opportunity, but also of very much of, of danger. We know a fair amount about the site because uh, my dear late friend Bob Bradley uh, led excavations there from 1986 to 2001. I was privileged to help out on some of those digs, and we were able to un uncover uh, a significant story about the place where Sir William Phipps was, was born. Um, it was a large, sprawling farmstead. Uh, I'll, I'll imagine a 15 by 72 foot house with an L off the back and surrounding buildings. I like to think of a surround, think of a, a sort of the, about the first, first, uh, first main long, one of the first main longhouses, maybe the, about the dimensions of a, of a single wide trailer, right? Long, narrow house. Um, we know that the family uh, seems to have been modestly well off, though um, this is the plan of what Bob thinks it might have looked like, just this long kind of rambling house. Um, we didn't find any window glass in the excavation, so that may suggest that 
Mather may have been right that this is a pretty modestly wealthy family if they couldn't afford window glass. Um, and also, too, we know that this is a longhouse with, well, let's put it this way. <clears throat> the Phipps family lived in one end. Their cattle lived in the other. Now, that seems very bizarre to us, but it was good English medieval fashion. If you want your, your cattle are your most valued possession, that you want to keep them near. Um, and this was not uncommon in, in Maine in the 17th century, though, again, I think that someone like Cotton Mather, the sophisticated fellow who graduated from Harvard at 15 and was minister in Boston, he may have sort of thought of this as being a very somewhat rustic background, right, that Sir William was, uh, was, was raised in, where he talks about him uh, playing as a young boy with Native Americans, uh, children as well, and again, sort of at the edge of, of settlement. Um, Yet it was still, I think, it was a pretty impressive stand of houses and uh, shows that the Phipps family, I think, had done, done reasonably well for themselves on the frontier. Sir William was apprenticed as a, as a boy uh, to be a shipbuilder. Uh, and we believe he actually worked across uh, the bay from his house here on Arousic Island at the shipyard uh, and, and trading post of, of Thomas Clark and Thomas Lake, two Boston merchants who owned thousands of acres of land in the in the Kennebec region, and uh, is actually with, is within sight of, of his home. So he would have served as an in, uh, apprenticeship probably of seven years till he was around 20 or 21, starting at 13 or 14. And then he would, was a, would graduated, if you will, right? He was a journeyman. He earned his freedom, uh, 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 his freedom from, his, from his apprenticeship, and he had, though, the knowledge and skill to become a practicing shipwright, uh, which would have been, again, a very favorable occupation in New England in the 17th century, where, which is a center not only of the lumber trade, but then also the lumber is sawn into boards, we make ships out of them, and then we sell, sell uh, sh the, the lumber and the fish and the furs from New England all throughout the Atlantic world, right? And that it is that, that main economy in the 17th century is that, a, is that engine that really kind of drives the New England economy and frankly provides wealth for people like the Mathers and other folks in Boston. So once his, his apprenticeship is complete, probably around 1672, 73, he moves to Boston to seek his fortune, big city. He marries a young widow, Mary Spencer Hull, and he gets a contract to build a big ship, his first big commission. So with that commission, he goes home and some, some money to start up on the project. He goes home to back to Phipps Point to build the ship. Well, Sir William was a fellow who had lots of ups and downs in his career, and this was the first one because, unfortunately, King Philip's War would intervene into, uh, into the story. Uh, the first war that pits Native, American, uh, Native Americans in Maine against the English colonists uh, on a surprise attack on August 14, 1676. Uh, the Phipps House and nearby Arousic are attacked and and uh, virtually destroyed. Um, Arousic was, was attacked first, and at that point, the, uh, Sir William, uh, the future Sir William and his family um, must have seen and heard what was going on. At the time, the ship is not quite complete. It's not really quite ready to launch, but they launch it anyhow and are able to safely make their way before the Native Americans can get them. But I assume as they're sailing downriver, they probably see their whole property just going up in flames. Again, really, really high drama. Uh, so I keep on waiting for Steven Spielberg to find this story, right? Um, so William is ruined. He arrives with a half-finished boat. Uh, and he's already gotten most of the money. So he's being sued by the, the, the fellow who's, who's commissioned the boat. And he has to start again. Everything at home is gone. So what does he do? Well, he takes to the sea. He is a, he's a, as a ship builder. He's got some experience as a sailor. And we know that by the early 1680s, when we first see him again, he's one of a group of Boston sea captains seeking to Spanish, salvage Spanish treasure galleons in the Caribbean. Uh, no one had done this yet, uh, but this was, you know, the treasure fleets would lose a, the occasional ship to the hurricanes. And, uh, Sailors down in the Caribbean, English sailors, would hear rumors about where some of these ships might lie. And he gets a hot rumor, a hot lead on a wreck, and he goes to England to get financial backing. 
Now, miraculously, this young, near illiterate farm boy from a despicable plantation in Maine gets an actual audience with King Charles II, um, and who agrees to give him two English frigates and money to back the venture and sends him off to the Caribbean to raise and search for and raise a treasure. Well, amazing that he was able to talk his way into this. But then again, unfortunately, the expedition fails. They don't find the big treasure. They come home with a few coins and that's about it. And one would think that would be the end of William Phipps and sort of disgrace. And he would have come home with his tail between his legs to Boston and we never would have heard from him again. But no, this guy is one of the most resilient people you can imagine. Um, but stop right there for a second. Again, how does a poor, illiterate Maine sea dog from a poor, obscure family get royal support? And I have really started thinking about this, and I realized, you know, he must have been a great talker, but I'm not sure anybody could be that good a talker in a very status-bound society that England was at the time. How does a sea dog talk his way into an audience with the king? Well, the answer is, of course, that his family was not as poor and obscure as Cotton Mather might have us think. You know, if you want to have that great hero who's risen from the masses, you can't have him rise from the gentry and the nobility, right? But in fact, actually, uh, when I was doing research at the Bodleian Library at Oxford, I came across the Phipps family tree and coat of arms. So they weren't quite as down uh, as one might, might suspect. And there's, uh, there's, there's William right there, the William, the, the grandfather. Uh, there you see him here on the tree that I laid out. He's actually of the Phipps family of Nottingham. And they're armogenerous. They have a coat of arms, right? They are members of the gentry. And uh, in fact, actually, clearly William's problem was he descended, he was the, like the youngest son of the youngest son, right? Um, so his family didn't inherit the land and the estate and the titles, etc. But if you look down the line there, see there's his father James, there's, there he is. But look at the other branch of the family, they do okay. Constantine Phipps, Sir William's contemporary, his cousin, who while Phipps was governor of Massachusetts, Constantine was Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. A plum political appointment to have indeed. Um, and you can see this is, this is what his cousin looks like. So um, he was the poor cousin, the poor cousin from, from the new world, right? Um, so clearly, yes, uh, I don't think the Phippses over here were all that wealthy. They done, may have done reasonably well, but by English standards, they were, they were the poor cousins. But I think it was just being the poor cousin that you know, the family had to look after, and they had enough connections, clearly, from the position of, of, of Constantine and others, to get him the audience with the people who might then, if he could convince them, to get him the audience with the king. So he had some help, more so than he probably... Uh, would have cared to admit, I think. Uh, but he did have some connections that he was able to use. And in fact, thanks to those connections, despite his failure, Phipps miraculously gains English backing for a second treasure voyage a couple years later in 1687. This time the king says, thanks, but no thanks. But he does convince a number of wealthy Englishmen to back him. And this time, he does strike it rich. He has a, uh, here you can see actually a map of the, of the, of the, where the, the discovery, where the wreck was found. And uh, it, is, it is an amazing voyage of discovery. They find a, a Spanish treasure galleon that has wrecked on a shallow reef. Uh, parts of the ship is still above ground, apparently. Most of the wreck they're diving for is in no more than 30, 40 feet of water. And uh, that means that you can actually dive on it. So they actually uh, go down to the Bahamas and they pick up pearl divers uh, who can do deep sea diving. And they also, apparently Phipps hit, was the inventor of some sort of subterranean diving bell, which essentially you took like a, a, wooden, a wooden cask and cut it in half and tarred it to make it water resistant. And you could lower it underwater and the divers could go down and get air out of it. Um, so he had, he had some, by the 17th century, state-of-the-art technology, apparently, for diving. Um, 
and they, 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 they haul in a huge amount of, of gold and silver, particularly silver. Um, they did try, Phipps actually, when they got, they found that much of the, of the wreck was stuck in coral. And uh, the, he had this really bad idea, though, was to, let's take a, like, see if we can seal up a keg of gunpowder and blow that up underwater. Um, it's a good thing that failed because it probably would have killed them all. Uh, and at least anybody underwater trying to deal with it. Um, but by this stage, when they gave up at that point, they went home and they, they bring with them treasure beyond anybody's wildest dreams. Um, you can see here, uh, this is a National Geographic article on the wreck of the Concepcion, the wreck. Uh, they actually went back and did a, did a, a uh, in this, I think it was in the late 60s, early 70s, did another uh, cleanup on it and found a huge fortune still left behind because of Phipps's, the techniques just were not state of the art enough to get the, the but just look at what was left behind even. So um, the wreck of the Concepcion is valued at two, then at 210,000 pounds. Now just in today's money, that would be what, about 300, 350, 400,000 um, dollars. Back then, this is, this is billions of dollars, right? I mean, this is more money than you can, can imagine. Uh, and, um, is just an incredible, incredible haul. Sir William's personal share as captain of the ship is 11,000 pounds. Now, that's hard to think about what that means, but suffice it to say, if you were your standard uh, oh, resident of Boston or a town on, on, on the coast of Maine uh, in the 1680s, when you died, you might leave an estate, your clothing, your livestock, your house, cash on hand, everything, probably worth maybe around 200, maybe 250 pounds. That gives you an idea of the order of the magnitude of how rich Sir William Phipps was. And he isn't just rich, but he is a hero. Because remember, England is still uh, the enemy of the Spanish to the south. And look at this, right under their noses, we stole the contents of a treasure galleon away from them and enriched the English crown, because, oh yes, by the way, the crown still gets its, its percentage. I think it's, what, 10, 15% off the top of any treasure. So uh, the king still did quite well, did, did Charles II. Um, or actually, James II by this time, because Charles has, has passed away. Um, James is knighted for his efforts, and he comes home in time though, for a major war. Now, it's interesting, the, he decides to come home to New England, because frankly, I think this guy at the time, was, he was the most famous New Englander. He probably was the most famous Englishman for his, this incredible feat, right? Um, I honestly think that if Sir William had wanted to, he could have sat in the pubs in London and would never have had to buy a drink or a meal the rest of his life, that people would have just paid to, to, to talk to him and hear his amazing story. But he does come home, and he comes home just in time for a major war, uh, King William's War, which started actually on the coast of Maine in 1688 and finally ends in 1697. And this, like many of the colonial wars, of which this is really just the second after King Philip's War, goes very badly indeed for the New Englanders. Uh, at the time, of course, Maine is, has become part of Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts military efforts are never particularly good. And we have all of these exposed settlements on the edge of the frontier, um, places to the north here, like Salmon Falls, Oyster River, Fort Loyal in present day Portland, Fort uh, uh, Pemaquid with Fort William Henry. Um, and they're incredibly vulnerable to attack because in King William's War, we have the Native Americans, the Wabanaki, who we'd been fighting with in King Philip's War, and now they have a new ally, the French of Acadia and Quebec. And they are able to pick off these settlements, in many cases, one by one. And uh, not long after the war starts, uh, Pemaquid Falls uh, in, a, in a raid in the summer of 1689. There's a major attack on, on Salmon Falls, present day uh, Berwick region. Fort Loyal in Portland Falls. Uh, and it just seems like the whole coast of New England is going to go up in smoke as the, as the French and their native allies are picking off the furthest most away settlements and keep on coming further and further down the coast. And in fact, the war will end up going rather miserably and in the long run. But 
After all of these devastating defeats in 1689 and 1690, Massachusetts gets this brilliant idea of to take the war on the offensive and that we are going to launch an expedition or two against the French in Canada. And who better to lead this expedition than the New England Knight? Now, unfortunately, here's the problem. Sir William, yes, was a, was a good experienced sailor. He had no military experience whatsoever, right? He was a good sh sh ship, ship commander, but he'd never been in charge of a large operation. In spite of that, though, in, in August of uh, July, of, excuse me, June and July of 1690, he leads a successful expedition leaving Boston of, uh, I think it was about four or five ships, and they attack Port Royal, the capital of French Acadia, and they fire almost without a shot. Port Royal is not well fortified. Um, they manage to, uh, to seize quite a bit of treasure and, and loot and bring it home. Imagine including things like the mass service and the silver cross and the chapel. I always have this wonderful thought of what on earth did these New England, these Puritans do when they got a hold of all these, all these gold crosses? Well, of course, they burnt, they boiled them down, you know, melted them down right away for, for, for uh, gold and silver. Um, so actually, this, this expedition was, was somewhat successful. And the, uh, the colony became emboldened to say, well, that was pretty easily done. Let's try again. Now, in this kind of, we should point out, it's interesting because they didn't have enough support to leave a fort up there guarded by the English. So instead what Sir William did was he just had all the French Canadian subjects, the French Acadians, swear an oath of allegiance to the King of England. He said, okay, that's good, now I'm going home. Well, we'll see about that, right? Because once, once, once Phipps left, the French felt that their bond was broken and that they didn't have to be loyal to the crown anymore, but we'll come back to that. So, Phipps then led a disastrous, disastrous expedition against Quebec. Good grief. Um, so the problem is, first off, they, they, it's going to be, it's, a, it's this huge expedition that sails all the way, all the way up the coast and all the way down the St. Lawrence. Now at the same time, there's a, supposed to be a military expedition that goes overland up the Champlain, up to the Champlain Valley, um, for, up the Hudson River and up Lake Champlain um, with the Mohawk Indians and their English allies from New York. That attack f fails. What the idea would be is that that, would, that took uh, Governor Frontenac and the troops away from Quebec and up to Montreal to fight off that invasion. And meanwhile, Phipps and his boys would just slip right into Quebec and take it over. Sounds good in theory, but once that expedition fails, you're in deep trouble, right? And any of you who've been to Quebec and been down in Lower Town, if you can imagine actually trying to storm that place, of course, as, as Benedict Arnold found, uh, even with a fair amount of surprise, right, was not an easy nut to crack. And unfortunately, by the time Phipps arrived, you can see that that element of surprise had kind of been lost. And also the troops at Frontenac had come back from Montreal and they were sitting there waiting for them. So it becomes a disaster. It takes them, uh, they leave in August and it takes them until early November. They face bad weather, bad winds before they even arrive at Quebec. Um, so pretty much everyone on board, the, the, it's a major expedition, 34 ships, 2,300 militiamen. Uh, it is, it is um, the, by far the largest military expedition I think that America had undertaken until that point, right? And this is all undertaken by Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, but it is an ultimate disaster. Um, when they get up there, they do find that Frontenac's there and there's not much they can do about it. Um, they have some minor combat only 30 casualties, but on the way back, hundreds, hundreds of men die of smallpox, uh, which has broken out on board the ship. And one description says uh, when, the, when the ships get back into harbor in December, that they have the dead frozen bodies stacked like cordwood on the decks of the ship. And when they get to Boston, guess what? The smallpox spreads throughout Massachusetts. Um, so they lose four ships on the way home. Uh, this is a financial disaster of the highest magnitude, um, so much so that it, it forces the colony of Massachusetts Bay to issue paper money, the first government ever to do so. Um, inflation is rampant, despite Sir William Phipps apparently invests a fair amount of his own money in buying the paper money to sort of, you know, build up the credit and make people assured that the money will be good but uh, it, they, they have just uh, damaged the economy seriously. Uh, 
One of those ships, the Elizabeth and Mary, that was lost on the way was actually found in the St. Lawrence back in 1994. And I was fortunate enough to be a part of the international team that uh, explored the artifacts. I, 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 they invited me up to, you know, I didn't have my dive license, otherwise I would have gone up and do dove on her. But uh, amazing time capsule filled with all these artifacts from the Dorchester Militia Company. Um, but these boys, over 50 of them uh, from the company, were lost. Um, they saw the ship sailing into a fog bank as they were leaving. They never saw the ship again, and that was it. And no one ever heard from them again. Um, and I, I, there were people writing their wills in Dorchester. 20 years later, a father said, you know, and to my son, if he ever comes back from Canada, they never did. So the, in many ways, I consider these to be America's, you know, first ma Amer major military expedition. Uh, in some ways, I think these are America's first missing in action, right? Um, they paid a heavy toll. They, the whole, you know, uh, a large chunk, the whole Dorchester militia just gone. Uh, and, and others as well, too. Now, again, this though shows Sir William Phipps' resilience, because you'd think after this that this would be, Sir William would have had a very quiet career and you'd never hear more from him. But despite the disaster, he soon becomes the governor of Massachusetts Bay. In fact, he's the first royal governor of the colony under its new 1691 charter. And he and his political ally, the leading minister of Massachusetts, Reverend Increase Mather, are the ones who pull about uh, this, this new charter, and they arrive back in Boston from England in May 1692 with the new charter. Folks, this is not a good time to be arriving home in Massachusetts because the war continues to go badly, and guess what? The Salem witch trials are underway. Now, I don't consider those two facts to be a coincidence. Um, Having said that, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, I won't belabor because I have talked about the witch trials here before, but if you're inter interested, there is no single answer to what happened in 1692. That's why I call my book A Storm of Witchcraft. It was a perfect storm of forces, but there were so many bad things going wrong in the colony. We have factionalism in Salem Village. There's religious turmoil over the perceived decline of Puritanism. There's concern over this new governor and his charter. People are kind of concerned about Phipps because he's an outsider and they know his early as late January that he's coming as governor with a new charter, and he's not really one of them. He'd only recently joined the Mathers Church, uh, and he, before that he seems to be this, this kind of this sailor farm boy from Maine. They're, they're worried about that. They're worried about what's going to be in the charter. They're also concerned because it's the worst weather in the Little Ice, uh, the little ice Age, uh, and, and historically bad weather. They didn't know that at the time. We know that now, right? Um, historically bad weather, crop failure, famine, uh, which leads, and then you have the military disaster against the French and the Native Americans. That leads to inflation, high taxes, economic failure, disaster. And short answer is it's not, surprised, not surprising that people saw witches then because with these sorts of things happening, they knew that Satan had to be loose in their colony. So the odds were stacked, I think, against Sir William at this stage on all counts. And I think even an experienced politician would have had his hands full trying to resolve these multiple problems. Phipps only brings the whips trials to an end, however, when his wife Mary is accused of being a witch. Probably a sensible thing to do. There are many reasons why she was accused, including witches in the family. She had a sister-in-law in Maine um, who had actually, or actually a, a cousin's sister-in-law, I think it was, who had been accused of witchcraft in Saco in the 1660s. And witchcraft was believed, of course, to pass through families. So, Also, too, the fact that he was a treasure hunter and treasures were guarded by demons and you had to charm the demon. So there are lots of reasons why people might have looked at the Phippses a little oddly. So Phipps said, okay, that's it. We're bringing an end to this as soon as Mary was accused. But by then, of course, 19 people had died. Phipps will gain increasingly enemies in number throughout his governorship. Um, a lot of people are unhappy with the Salem witch trials. And uh, increasingly, there are, there are accusations of, of corruption, of conflict of interest. Um, a lot of it is made up, like the fact that, oh, that he's in league with pirates and taking a cut of the pirates' earnings. I don't think that was true, but there were other things that actually, yeah, he probably was, he, there was some definite self-interest. Now, having said that, in the 17th century, people liked to become appointed governor because it's supposed to give them the opportunity to some graft and corruption, some of which was okay, you know. Um, you know, uh, it just, uh, what does they say? Bulls and bears do fine, but, but pigs get slaughtered. That's the way it was with governors in the 17th century. As long as you, as long as you were discreet about your graft, you'd do just fine. Apparently, they, some people thought Phipps was being a little excessive. Um, 
So in 1694, he is finally recalled by the crown to London to answer the many charges against them of corruption, of, of political. He also finds himself in the middle of this huge political fight uh, in Massachusetts, of which uh, he is stuck in the middle. Uh, and it's, it's very, it's a, it was, again, it was, it was a, it's a dicey time, I think, for anyone to try to be governor. So he's sent back to London. He catches a cold and he dies in 16, January 1695 before can he, he can even defend himself against charges. And you can see here, actually, this is an invitation. Uh, General, uh, Major General Waite Winthrop, uh, which Salem, actually Salem Witchcraft Judge Winthrop's invitation to attend the funeral of Sir William Phipps. Phipps was, again, this was a celebrity funeral. So everybody in London would want to turn up for this thing. So they only, they had to issue invitations to family and friends in London so that they, this, the funeral wouldn't be overrun by people. That's how famous and important Sir William Phipps was. But I also think too, this sort of explains why uh, we don't have the movie, right? Because it doesn't end with the upbeat story and the happy ending at all. It just ends with a question mark, you know? Um, I think Phipps was a good enough talker that he could have sort of talked himself out of things and ended up going back as governor back to Massachusetts. But he didn't have a, even he didn't have a chance. He, he, he died before, before his time. Okay, so I've talked now about 40 minutes, and so far I haven't even mentioned the word Bethel once, I don't think, really. So what does all this have to do with Bethel and its founding 250 years ago? Well, the key connection here is that the township that we now know as Bethel was originally granted to veterans of Phipps's failed 1690 expedition. Now this takes a little explanation. Massachusetts was, shall we say, land rich but cash poor, right? Throughout its history, it had a lot of land. And as you'll see here in this map from 1702, a lot of empty land on the frontier. They didn't have a lot of cash. So traditionally, starting from the 1630s and 1640s, Massachusetts essentially used all of this territory almost as a bank to, to, to award to people uh, to pay them back for their services. Regularly for, for members of the legislature, for the governor or his deputy um, who weren't receiving any salary, um, but then if they might incur expenses, uh, attending meetings and so on, um, eventually the government would just give them land. Maybe the best example of this that I know of is Thomas Danforth, the deputy governor, who was given Danforth's plantation or Danforth's farm um, for uh, basically for money that was owed by the colony. Well, today, Danforth's plantation, we call, we call the town of Framingham. Um, so that's the kind of, now at the time, we say like, it was, wasn't, it was pretty worthless. It was on the edge of nowhere, right? Someday it might be worth something. If you want to pay some people to go settle it, then eventually it may have some value, right? But at the time, Framingham was, in the, in the 1670s and 80s, Framingham was on the edge of nowhere, right? Because again, most of the settlement in Massachusetts is really inside Route 128 and then some at that point. So with this tradition in hand, Massachusetts started to get creative in the 1730s in, 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 in funding things. Traditionally, members of the militia had received almost no pay, no pensions, for the wounded vets or for survivors. All of those people from Dorchester who'd lost their family. Um, one fellow made it, was on another shipwreck from, uh, on a boat from Roxbury. And he, he finally comes back home after four years and he, he writes a petition to the general court. And he says, please sirs, you know, could you help me? Um, my ship wrecked, um, I was one of the few to get ashore. Um, I almost starved to death, but I ate wood and vermin and then the Native Americans caught us and beat us and enslaved us. And then they traded us to the French who didn't treat us much better. And I've been basically, I'm crippled now. I've, been, I've come home after four years. I'm from a poor Roxbury family. I guess some things never change maybe, right? Roxbury was very much of a working class neighborhood then and now. And uh, he says, you know, my family has basically, you know, spent every money they have to redeem me, to pay my captivity because they had to ransom him back. So please, could. I, I, I throw you on my mercy. Can you help me and my family? And there's this, the petition survives and it's, you know, uh, issued by the Massachusetts General Court approved 20 pounds, struck out 10 pounds for services rendered. 10 pounds back then, again, 
not very much money. We might buy you a couple of cows, that was about it. So by the 1730s, there's been a lull in the wars. The frontier seems relatively safe. In the meantime, you have all of these people inside Route 128, if you were, right? As you have more kids, more generation, more people looking for land, needing to go to the countryside. And Massachusetts decides that the best way to, to invest in this countryside is to make do on some of those overdue promises to soldiers and to, to their descendants and to their, to, to their widows. And they start this off about 1730, 1731, with a series of what are called Narragansett townships. These are townships that are awarded to the survivors and the descendants of men who during King Philip's War had joined the militia and had fought in this horrible December campaign to, to attack the Narragansetts in Rhode Island. And I say horrible because back then warfare didn't usually take place in the winter. And there was a high loss of life and many people who had frozen arms and limbs that, that never recovered. It turned the war though. And thanks to that surprise attack, they kind of started to break the resistance of the Native Americans and uh, they would, English would go on to win that war. So the people had long thought that they owed something to the survivors of that campaign. And they granted a series of Narragansett townships, they were called. I think Narragansett Township number one is what we now call Buxton, Maine. Uh, and, all, and Hollis, Maine was also a Narragansett Township as well. Well, a couple years later, the veterans of the 1690 campaign said, hey, what about us? And in fact, actually, the legislature in 1735 passed a law granting townships to who they called Canada soldiers, right? Those soldiers who had accompanied some of those several thousand soldiers and their survivors who had gone on the expedition to Sir William Phipps. And they established a law where they essentially set up rules where groups could apply to the legislature to be awarded a township. And if the veteran had died, then their oldest male heir would stand to gain that right. And it's all very elaborately written that they then have to pay 10 pounds to, their, to the other heirs who would have shared in the estate. And if, and if there weren't any boys, then it was the eldest daughter, right? Um, most of these groups would apply for townships by town, the town they came from, because militia companies were organized by towns, right? Now, I, I want to st stress too that in many cases, people who are becoming these proprietors of these townships have no desire at all to move to Maine, the frontier. But what they do know is someone will and that they can sell that land, all right? And I think actually, Randy, you may know better than I, I actually don't think anybody who was an original grantee of Sudbury, Canada actually ended up settling here. I think all of those shares were swapped out. And what that would mean is if you had two or three shares, you'd, you'd take those and you'd get your money for those. And then maybe you could buy a farm for your daughter so that she could live next to you back in Dorchester, right? Or, or back in Roxbury or back in Sudbury. Um, but so it was an important way though to provide a pension or some sort of compensation to those veterans and also a way to get people out on the frontier in an organized fashion. And again, create kind of a buffer because the next, here's the thing, the established towns, you know, uh, the next time that there was an attack, uh, please take out those frontier settlements first so we'll have an early warning system for when the Native Americans or the French are going to attack us. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I would have wanted to be part of that early warning system myself, but if that's the only way you're going to get a farm, if you're from a poor family who lives in one of the older settlements where after two or three generations that 100 acre farm has been divided amongst sons and grandsons, maybe that couple hundred acre farm only you get is 20 or 30 acres. Are you going to try to take 20 or 30 acres of really exhausted soil in a place like Salem, Massachusetts? Or are you going to head out to the frontier where you can get a couple hundred acres and hopefully be prosperous if the Native Americans don't get you, right? Those are your choices. So what we have is a series of townships called Canada townships. Dorchester, Canada that I talked about, the, 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 the expedition of the Elizabeth and Mary with all those men lost. Dorchester, Canada is today known as Ashburnham, Massachusetts. And as a kid, I grew up in Fitchburg and I always wondered what Dorchester, Canada meant. And then when I started studying, because I knew that Dorchester, Canada was Ashburnham. And then when I started studying the expedition, I said, wow, 
absolutely. There were dozens of these towns. Uh, Rowley, Canada becomes Ringe, New Hampshire. And yes, Sudbury, Canada becomes Bethel. So the men from Sudbury who fought on Phipps's expedition are awarded a township by the legislature. Right? And there's, here's the original township map for Sudbury, Canada in 1794, Massachusetts. And yes, we were part of Massachusetts back then. Massachusetts wanted a, a map drawn of every town in the colony, in, in the state. And uh, this is the original 1795 map of Sudbury, Canada. And you'll see here in 1795, yes, it says Sudbury, Canada, because it's only the next year, as Randy pointed out, that Sudbury, Canada becomes incorporated as Bethel. The plantation of Sudbury, Canada, right? So Sudbury's veterans had actually, though, they had first petitioned for a township back in 1737. Back when, just when the law was passed, there was a mad rush and veterans for about, about 15 or 20 towns petitioned for townships. Um, unfortunately for Sudbury, they were kind of some of the last on the list. And by the time they get to their petition, there weren't any lands available in Massachusetts proper, right? Um, some of the Sudbury, so in other words, places, places like Ashburnham, no longer available. Central Massachusetts pretty much all claimed. Okay, well, what about southern New Hampshire? Because at the time, the, the southern boundary of New Hampshire and northern boundary of Massachusetts was in dispute. And in fact, actually, Massachusetts granted a few towns like Ringe, which we know is in New Hampshire now, but at the time was considered to be part of Massachusetts. Well, by the mid, by, by 1737, 36, 37, they pretty much determined that, nope, we've solved that boundary, and guess what, Massachusetts, you can't grant land in southern New Hampshire because it's New Hampshire, not Massachusetts. That only left the people from Sudbury with some, at the time, I should say, nothing against Sudbury, Canada. At the time, some unpleasant options. Uh, only places in the interior Maine, and it is still a very dangerous place. Now, in 1737, there is peace on the frontier, but by 1740, 41, we'll be fighting again against the French and the Native Americans. Um, no one in their right minds wants to stake out a township and move to Maine. So no one's interested in leaving Sudbury to do so. And that township petition gets sort of put aside and not acted on. And a generation passes. Because Maine's interior will only finally be safe to settle after the last of those frontier wars with the French and the Native Americans end. And it effectively ends here with the fall of Quebec to the British in 1759, when Wolfe takes Quebec, when, you know, that famous scene, the death of General Wolfe at the walls of Quebec, as he and Montcalm both die, and the British take Quebec, which really is the end of French, French Canada as a, as a colony. So it, it seems to me it's ultimately ironic, isn't it, that it took two expeditions, two invasions of Quebec to create Sudbury, Canada, right? The first failed expedition, which created all those militiamen who had a claim, and then the second expedition where, where Wolf captures Quebec, which finally makes the interior of Maine safe, right? And it's, it's amazing to see how that settlement pattern grows. 1759, the line of settlement along the Saco River, for example, is around the falls of Buxton and Hollis, around Union Falls, Dayton. You're only about 10 miles inland from the coast, right? By 1761, people are living up in Freiburg. Boom, it's like pulling a cork out of the bottle. Let's get into the interior. Let's get the best spots. So it's not surprising that soon after the fall of Quebec, those petitioners for Sudbury who were still waiting on their township said, hey, now this land is actually worth something. Now someone is going to want to settle there. Now we're going to repetition the legislature once again. You can see here though, so again, see here in 1763, here's the map of New England. And as you'll see, that's, that's the Saco River, right? The Androscoggin River and the interior is not even on the map. As, late, as early as 1763, no one, in the, no one in their right minds has thought of establishing a settlement here quite yet. But 
They will almost immediately after this because in the next year in 1764, 75 men led by Josiah Richardson petitioned for the township yet again. What's remarkable is a couple things. First off, Richardson was actually from Woburn. I find it interesting too because I reckon, I mean, he's actually just distant like cousin or uncle of mine. Um, but he married a girl from Sudbury, lived in Sudbury. And in, 17, in the 1730s, he had been the secretary who'd led the petition. He was still around in the 1760s and led the petition effort again. And he is amongst the 55 Sudbury men. So in this case, he's really making the claim on behalf of his, his wife, right, who would have inherited the claim from, from her family. 55 of these men are from Sudbury. 20 are from other towns. Interesting group. Um, I actually, again, I found, I found another cousin. David Woods was one of the claimants. That's from my middle name or from the Woods family. Again, a Groton family. But for the most part, they were either from Sudbury um, or, uh, or from Framingham. And intriguing particularly to me was one name on the list, Samuel Paris. See, it all really is all about the Salem witch trials, right? Uh, because this Samuel Paris is either the son or the grandson of Reverend Samuel Paris, the notorious minister in the middle of the Salem witch trials. Um, he actually sticks around Salem until 1697 uh, when he goes to see if he can find a um, place where he might be a little more welcome. Long story short, he ends up moving to Sudbury where he marries Dorothy Noyes, who's the um, uh, daughter of one of the founders of the town, uh, one of the founding families. And, and actually, uh, Paris dies in Sudbury in 1719 and left descendants there, uh, including Samuel Paris, both a son and a grandson. I'm not sure which one this is on the list. Um, and by the way, as of last summer at least, Reverend Samuel Paris's house, which is still standing in Sudbury, was available for sale. And if you had, I think, $1.2 million, you could own it. Um, the, you look it up online, it's very interesting. The interior is very, mo most of it is very modern. It looked like, actually looked like the kitchen was probably worth about a million bucks right there. So anyhow, um, so uh, to me, again, it was really kind of interesting to look at some of those names of the people. And I, if you look at the, look at the list of the, of the Sudbury, uh, Sudbury Canada petitioners, uh, you, you might see some, um, some, not just some, some local families, but also some families in your, in, your, in your family tree that you had no idea had any connection at all to Sudbury, Canada. So I, I don't think anyone ever, as I said, I don't think any of them settled here, but it's kind of it's nice to see that part of that sort of story, right? Um, so the Sudbury, Canada Township is finally approved by the legislature. Uh, the next year in 1768, the legislature acts on the petition, uh, which means that Sudbury... Uh, is incorporated as a plantation or established as a plantation, not incorporated as a town, in June 1768. So indeed, happy 250th birthday to Sudbury, Canada. And again, one last thought, again, as I mentioned the last time I taught here too, is while, um, while it was mostly different people than the proprietors who ended up buying the land and settling here, some of the earliest settlers to this region actually had direct connections to the Salem witch trials, were, had, were ancestors. James Swan moves his family to Sudbury, Canada in 1780 from Methuen. His great uncle Timothy Swan was, in, was afflicted by witchcraft in 1692. This is his gravestone in the North Anders Over Cemetery. James's daughter, I talked last time about James's daughter, Nancy Swan, who married Jonathan Barker in 1788. And his, uh, Jonathan's great grandfather, William Barker, not only confessed to being a witch in 1692, but implicated dozens of others as being witches as well. Um, and uh, it's a very sort of interesting story of these people who, who clearly, who, by the way, we know uh, these folks were, were very, knew very well about their links to the Salem witch trials. Um, and uh, in fact, actually, when, um, I mentioned this last time, but it's almost worth repeating. When, um, in 1788, Nancy and Jonathan marry, and they, they actually lived up uh, on Sunday River, um, they, but they, uh, they decide to marry, again, this is the, things like a very current story. When she's, when she's several months pregnant, they decide they better get married. Um, do they get married up here? No. Do they get married back home in Methuen or Andover? No. They travel, imagine this, in 1788, traveling from Sunday River and Bethel all the way to Acton, Massachusetts, next to Concord, to get married. Neither have family living there, but the minister there or the minister there, the, excuse me, the justice of the peace there, uh, Amy Ruhama um, Faulkner is the grandson of, of, of Abigail Faulkner, an Andover woman 
who had been uh, accused of witchcraft and was only spared from the trials by the fact that she was pregnant. And in fact, um, it was the son of the son she was carrying who was that justice of the peace, Amy Rahama. Um, and it's really quite clear that the Swans, uh, 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 Nancy Swan and, and, um, and Jonathan Barker, traveled all the way to Acton very deliberately to be married by Amy Rahama Faulkner. So these people were very, if you think about this, so it's kind of fun we think about this, of, of, of all those sorts of the people, people who settled here in the 1780s knew about the Salem witch trials. They certainly knew about the Canada expedition. And they realized that even though they were in like the, the most extreme settlement in Massachusetts at the time, that they were tied into this bigger picture of the history of Massachusetts and New England. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I also, if people don't have, don't have my books, I'm happy to, to, to autograph and sell them as well too. Thanks for having me. Are there, yeah. are there characteristics of Bethel that you were conscious of, or of other Canada townships that are peculiar to Canada townships? I mean, in, in, in begging the question of connecting this, these larger and older events yeah. to this place. I, I mean, does it? Do they have a different sort of? town plan from the other sorts of developing towns or or whatever it may be yeah very regular right these new towns on the frontier are surveyed and and the, the lots are drawn so these tend to be the parts these are the parts of new england first off from a surveying point of view that are very regular as opposed to some of the older settlements again inside sort of 128 or even on the, the coast of like maine where you have like this these you know if, if you look at a house lots where i live in york um, in, in, in that part of the state, uh, your lots are like, you know, maybe like, a, you know, like a couple hundred feet of river frontage, and then you have 50 acres going back to, you know, but in this case, you have these just series of ranges laid out in a very orderly fashion, and I, I think, I honestly think one thing is that you could, these towns settled, and it, it is, they aren't just all those, the Canada townships, the, the Garagansi townships, but townships settled in that time period under the system. If you, if you were to do an aerial photograph of New England, these are the ones that are much more orderly, and you can still see those kind of checkerboard patterns. Now again, these are not perfectly orderly, like uh, like a place like Iowa, you know, under the Northwest Ordinance, where you have these 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 these, uh, four, these 160 acre parcels all laid out regardless. So I think certainly from the settlement pattern, that's true. I also you can also look pretty much um, there's a sort of a swath of the interior where these towns were laid out. If you go in you know, again, like 30, 40, 50 miles inland, where they were are all kind of laid out, it would have been that territory. Um, for the most part, they're settled by, um, again, they tend to be like, you know, the younger sons, um, sort of hard scrabble kind of families um, who don't have a lot. Sometimes, it's, it's interesting, sometimes, uh, you look at this, fascinating, I had a, a student write a master's thesis studying immigration out of Andover. And specifically, unfortunately, she studied specifically going in like the third generation to Connecticut. But what she found is there was, there's interesting patterns here. You have sometimes it'll be those hard scrabble young sons. In other cases, though, you would have people Middle-aged men. So again, I mentioned James Swan, right? He's got a wife who's old enough, a daughter who's old enough to marry. This is no 18-year-old kid setting out for the country. But what you would do is, it was people, that, I think the connected there was people who didn't have enough land, right? And what would happen is back home, if you had, um, you know, supposing, you know, originally your grandfather had had the 200-acre farm, and by the time it gets to you, it's been cut down to like 50 acres. And you have, and you don't get, you don't give land to your daughters. They, they marry, it's, it's, it's usually the, the sons, and the sons, your daughter will marry some son who will get the land. But think about this. If you have four sons, and you have 50 acres of land, that's a recipe for disaster. Because you need at least 30 or 40 acres to make a decent farm, right? That old French novel by Rengate, Toronto, Plot, 30 acres. Um, it's about the minimal farm you can get to. And beyond that, someone's got to go somewhere, right? Um, in, in Canada, they join the priesthood, and join the nunnery, and then, but then eventually they start coming down to Massachusetts. Same thing here. Um, once it gets to that level, either the sons go off, or guess what? You go with them. And you sell your 50 acre farm in a place like Andover for enough money to buy 400 acres up here in a place like Bethel. And there you know there'll be enough land for you, and for your sons, and for their sons. 
Maybe the next generation either, too, right? Yeah. How, how big were the plots that we're looking at here? <sighs> Is it, uh, the large ones are 100 acres each, but along the river, the intervale, the best farmland, those are 50 acres. Yeah. But here's the but here's the thing, if you're if you if you are um, if you're selling land or have some money down in Massachusetts either by selling land or just that the family gives you to get going, you know you can you can buy several hundred acres here, um, it, and, and it's 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 land is, is reasonably inexpensive. It's it's that sort of risk. Are you willing to take that risk? That's the trick. That's a good question. Yes, sir. Um, as I understand it, you got these parcels of land after the war, and you, and then you applied for it. Well, you, there were, there were, you, 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 you applied for a township. In this case, what I think is it six miles by six miles is. is, is That's what it was supposed, supposed to be. Supposed to be, but the surveyor, I mean, obviously not. The surveyors really <laughs> liked the river intervale, so they kept going toward Rumford. Yeah. And these surveyors, imagine surveying out in the middle of nowhere like that too. So that was, and then after, then they, uh, what would happen would be is then the township would be granted. And then all the people who were listed as proprietors would have rights to own it, uh, one share in it. My question is, if you didn't survive the war, and then they awarded land afterwards, was there some provision for giving the people who died during the war? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, many of the uh, uh, it's um, um, if you didn't if you didn't survive the war, or if you didn't last until 1735 or 1767. Yes, you'll see you see many of them. It'll be. Um, they'll give the list and they'll say on behalf of. Okay. So, um, so your your family, um, if if you if you died in the fighting or died after the war, your 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 um, your your nearest heir would would uh, could have absolutely applied to to get that right. Um, and if not, in, if there weren't enough in, in this township, then you'd get one in, in the other one. So, in other words, there's a bunch of framing hammers who were in on the, on the Sudbury. So it wasn't just be oh you're not from this town, but you could also. You could kind of sort of join any group. They tend to be organized by towns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So further east in Maine, before they could subdivide and sell off the land like this, they would have to have a treaty with the Indians. Yes. Tell us about Western Maine. <laughs> this is kind of the no man's land, right? Uh, which also explains why the last raid on Maine takes place. What is it? 1781, 1782 on on Sudbury, Canada, right? Um, so what happens is, as the as the wars progress, the Native Americans retreat into the interior, to some of the, the you know um, so far up river that the English won't be able to attack them. So traditional cornlands, places like uh, like Freiburg, like here, uh, places like like Canton Point that I took the wrong way in one morning this morning, ended up in Canton Point, which was in. No, I love Canton Point, but I'm going the wrong way. But that was but that was a huge beautiful intervale, yeah. like here, yeah. prime river bottom lands, which which are. Um, Native American homelands for, for, for thousands of years, right? And these, but these are areas that uh, that have not been part of sort of any of these treaty negotiations or anything. So um, what what really happened there is as much as like goodwill between the native settlers, right? People like like Molly uh, and of course when I'm, when I'm up anywhere near Andover, I have to go visit Molly Ockett's grave, right? Um, so it, it's a very different dynamic than what's taking place on the coast. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, you, 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 you also have you also have of course the Lovewell attack on Freiburg, which well, yes. which uh, 1720. 25, I think, and yes. which doesn't get enough attention. But that you know. Well, it does for me because for I, me I, I I lost two family members on it. The yeah. Woods boys actually, where I get my middle name. Because well, they I'm not related to William Fitch, so don't feel bad. Okay. <laughs> I mean, as, as I was like to point out, because they were foolish enough to go and level on a second expedition right. uh, up to Freiburg, uh, they have the privilege of being the first members of the family to be buried in Maine, right? Yeah, yeah. And actually, uh, I'm, um, I'm descended from one of the son, one of, from the son who was born posthumously, uh, from the father who was killed on the other So, they, but they're still, you know, occupying that part of the Saco Valley, and then. Yeah. And then we know, you know, immediately after that, they not only go north, but they go east, east and they yep. go to Indian Island. They join the Penobscots, and it there's becomes a, a real, there's a whole a real mix. And not, and they go north and east, and, and of course, um, after King Philip's War, the Native Americans, many of them will, will, they end up going all the way up to Canada to the refuges like at Sillery, um, where, by the way, I just read there's a really interesting archaeology they've been doing there, where they're finding all kinds of cool stuff from that original Native American mission site, and that invite. Of course, they invite the Wabanaki to come up and they'd live there with a Jesuit priest who would eventually con con 
usually convert many of them to Catholicism. But then they would also, also too, they kind of, after a few years ago, like, you know, this, this, is, this place is okay, but it's not home. And they'd, they'd, come, back, they'd come back down here. And there's a tradition of going back and forth for generations. Every time there's a war, there's danger, we're going to go back to, to Canada. We're going to come back down here. So there's actually, they go multiple different directions. And most of the, so the people on the Saco, when I, you know, when I was director years ago at the museum at Saco, um, very cognizant of that history, where you had some of the people who moved east, and so you, you clearly could, you know, there would clearly be um, descendants, and sometimes I think some of the, the Penobscots don't like to acknowledge this, but in many ways the Penobscot tribe today is, is made up of many of these different refugees. Yes, they're native Penobscots, but there's also many populations that they welcomed into the, in, into the tribe from places like the, like the Saco. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have others who moved up to, to Canada. And in fact, honestly, when we had a, um, in our collection, we had a, um, a skull at the time that it, one of these things that were brought into the museum in the 19th century, and it was, um, it, we had people look at it who were experts, and they said, yes, it is Native American, um, and at that point, we needed to be repatriated, obviously, for the proper Native tribe for reburial. And um, I had some problems with that, not because I didn't want to repatriate it, but because, to me, probably the closest relatives to those Saco River Indians were folks who now lived in Canada. And when I was told by the authorities is that when I, if I wanted, I said, well, I should really, we should repatriate it to, uh, to, to the Wabnaki uh, uh, in, in Canada. Um, I was said I would be breaking, told I'd be breaking a number, a number of federal laws if I did that. Uh, by removing, removing the, the human remains from the country and turning them over. So, instead, so in the end, they were turned over to the Penobscots, who were relatives as well, too, you know. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a, we could talk all day about, about Western Maine and, and Native Americans. It's, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating story, and it, and it does talk about, and Lovell's Raid and all these expeditions into the interior, right? And I was trying to think today, is the, the one, the fellow on, the, on Lovell's expedition who's buried out in the middle of this, like Bridgeton or somewhere over there, right? Was that from Lovell? The, um, it's the short story that Hawthorne wrote, was it Roger Malvoin's burial, right? And that's based on a true, more or less somewhat true story of a fellow who's, so when the first settlers came into, you know, central Maine, and like the seven, southern central Maine in the 1740s, they find this English burial in their backyard. <laughs> yeah, and some were buried right there at the battle. Battle. Well, they are right there, right, right by the pond. Right yes. by the pond, and then some yeah. families eventually went back and uh, claimed their remains. So some were actually removed and brought back to Massachusetts, but there are still yeah. still some buried, both natives and and uh, English buried right there by the pond. And there's, it's, it's amazing the sort of things you know the, the Native American art. I, I've done some archaeology in the interior, actually, at Camp Point, and it's amazing the mix of European and Native American artifacts you find. Anyone else have a question right here? Question? Uh, when you look at this map, obviously some of those parcels would be more desirable than others. Yes. How did they determine who received which parcel or how many parcels you did receive? Usually, by, usually you got one parcel, usually by lot. Now, I don't know, with the river bottoms, did they divide them up separately? Do you know, Randy? Um, I know they had meetings of the yeah, of the proprietors and certain. Uh, I know Joseph Twitchell was right. one was head of the proprietors. Yeah. And his son actually came here, and uh, uh, Dr. Mason's uncle was Eliezer Twitchell, one oh, yeah. of, one of the sons. But you would get uh, you would get so many shares. So uh, I think there was a certain. Priority system. System. And sometimes you might have depends on how many shares you would bought too. I think. Right. How many shares you would bought. And the other thing too is, and I don't know. I I, I don't know in, in Bethel what happened. And I know in most of the other towns what what um, all of the land wouldn't necessarily be divided into one. Some of it. I guess you don't have any commons in Bethel, there, do you? Any what? Common land initially. Some of the other because the proprietors. It's interesting these people, right. the proprietors. It's a really interesting group in each town because you have to you you have the people of the proprietors. Who are um, usually they meet separately than like a town meeting because not all people who live in the town who are freemen are proprietors. They don't necessarily own a share, and you could actually, in, in a lot of times, you could buy and own, buy and sell shares of the propriety. And in a lot of the towns, um, the more earlier towns before the Canada townships, you'd have the proprietors um, who would have the undivided common. So where I live in New York, for example, which was became a town in the 60, incorporated in the 1650s in Massachusetts. The northwest quadrant of the town, essentially the area where Mount Akimekis is today, was the state in outer commons and, and wasn't divided until the 19th century. And what you see is, you can see in the deeds, people are buying and selling shares and inheriting shares of the propriety. Um, so, you know, I, and so like, 
and I give to my son my two shares as a proprietor of the town of York. Because they get to the stage and they say, no more proprietors. Mm -hmm. But I think here's a little bit different. I don't think there ever was any open common land in the Canada townships. I think they no. were all yeah, the divvied out initially, right? Right, the proprietors here were conti they continued to meet right into the 1790s. So you had settlers here, you had proprietors, and I, maybe even after the town was incorporated, the, the, we talk about the common out in front of us. Bethel actually has two commons. Right. It's the town common, it's the village common. There's one in front of the Middle and Vale meeting house. But these were all privately owned and given to the town. The right. Twitchell family gave the common one of the meeting house. The meeting house was built close to the river. They took it back and planted corn there, so it wasn't given until um, 1838. So and it's, it's a, it's a later thing. And the state law requires that one lot shall be um, reserved for the ministry and that one lot shall be reserved for Harvard College. And that doesn't mean that Harvard's going to establish a branch campus. What that, what that means is that the profits from selling that lot will be given to Harvard, to Harvard College as well. Mm -hmm. did, they, did they say we have so many people in Sudbury who have a claim to this and that's how we'll decide how many lots? Or did they say lots should be 100 acres? So I think they usually said it was usually 100 acre lots. And I think. So I, I, it's, it's kind of, we don't know, I mean, reading the history sounds like they've never come across the original proprietor's books, or have they? Is no, no. So, no. so we, don't, we don't know, it's a little bit of a mystery about that, but we do know, I think what, what happened is, is that, you know, in a, in a six square mile block of 100, 100 acres east, there should be enough for all people from most towns, and again, in some cases, that's why you have other people coming in from other towns who perhaps hadn't gotten theirs, so it wasn't like, you know, this is your only chance if you're from Sudbury to get land. Um, it, but that's the kind of the way it ended up being sort of their focus of, of organization. Right. 1891, Dr. Lapham, History of the Town History, said, Still, yeah. said that the records disappeared. disappeared. Uh, yeah. The story was that there were some unusual dealings by the proprietor. <laughs> so that was a good reason that the records disappeared. So they may have disappeared. So there were real estate scams. <laughs> oh, I, mean, I mean, when you hear the whole story, you say well, you're missing the real estate scams. I, I won't say that. You can, Dave. <laughs> All right. Well, that's like, I, there's, you know, the, in, uh, in Devil of Great Highlands, I talked about this, uh, this fateful meeting of the Portsmouth, New Hampshire selectmen at George Walton's Tavern one year, one day in like 1655, at which point they literally threw the earlier town records into the fireplace and burned them deliberately because they were trying to cover up some of these sorts of shenanigans. Right? <laughs> so, things never really changed, do they? <laughs> On the configurations of the, of the parcels up there, why along the river are those long and narrow parcels, and the ones furthest in the river are square? Well, those are small. Those, those, are, those are the 50-acre yeah. lots of the best land. That's intervale land, the best for farming. That's the flat intervale land that the Indians planted corn on. Oh, okay. That's it, the, that's, those are the fields that you see when you drive along. And a lot of it would have still been, would have been, rich, still been cleared. Rich, you wouldn't have had to cut trees down or anything. You could just go there. Right. Friburg was the same way along the south. Yeah. You could just go there and farm it. So those are the, the really the, the desirable laws. In fact, actually, um, these these today what we consider like Martian land, right, was actually worth twice as much money as upland back then because it was so rich and you didn't have to clear the trees off and you just put your cattle out on it to, to feed right off the bed. If you if you follow this through, if you can picture where the mountains are on this on the lower right and yeah. on the left. One last question: yeah. uh, Did you have to fertilize that, manure those? Lots to grow things on them, or did people flooded, use flooded. the newer back? Well, the, the, flooded, the, the river lots right. mostly just they just flood and they bring it's in the natural flooded. fertilizer, so you're good. But you're absolutely right. right. The other lots, you know, you got to clear you got to clear the trees. You got you got you got, you got, you got to, yeah you got to clear the rock. You got your first crop is of rocks, right? And then uh, and then um, and then you want you, you want to do a lot as much pasture as you can because you need the manure to enrich the soils as well too. Now also having said that too, realize that in the seven. In the, in the 17, uh, 70s and 80s. Now, by the way, and of course, you know, you, you also have another 250th anniversary coming up in a couple of years when they actually finally settled here, right? It took them a couple of years. But, but um, did people know that about manure back then? I, it, well, that's what I was going to say is they didn't, they, they, the agricultural improvement movement doesn't come to New England until the early 1800s. Uh, so you're about 20 years away, 1810, 1815. Uh, the British, though, have already started. Um, Really, under George III, in the late in the 1760s, 1770s, they've really begun to, to, to look at agricultural improvements. A matter of fact, there's a very famous famous English figure, Sir Jethro Tull, from which the band got its name, um, who were, was the agri agrarian reformer in England of like the 1770s. 
And if you read the, the, the English uh, literature of the day, though, even, even uh, George III, the, the crazy mad monarch, fancied himself as a bit of an agricultural improvement expert. And he, he sometimes would write anonymously to the newspapers his, his tips and suggestions for farming uh, from, from Farmer George. <laughs> so it was, there were people who were beginning to figure that out, and they knew that um, way back to medieval times, they, they understood the, the basic idea that um, you would leave, if you would have like a three field system in your village, and you'd farm two of them at a given time, and you'd lie the, let the third one lie fallow, and that's where you would pasture the livestock, which would let the, let the soils replenish. You'd, if you asked them about nitrogen fixation and stuff like that, they wouldn't have understood what you were talking about, but they, they got the idea that there was a relationship between manure and, and uh, oh, okay. crops. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm wondering how the, the town line of Bethel changed, because I assume that up near the top of that map, that's the area that's now Hanover. Which is a different town. It is, right. 1843 so from the point at the top, which is Nury Corner, at the very at the top, the pointed part, from yeah. there towards Tad. That was taken. Everything on the other side of the river, uh, along with Howard's Gore, they, they would run these lines with a chain and they're on rough ground and you end up with Gore or yeah. heater pieces, as they call them. That heater piece was 3,000 acres. And These were surveyors' errors. Right. They were Stan, Stan's ancestor, board. Phineas Howard of Temple, New Hampshire, said that'd be a great, great piece of land had water power on it, and that's what they're looking for is water power. Yeah, exactly. To start mills, and the first frame buildings in Bethel are at the foot of Mill Hill, yeah. August 1774. So the heater piece is right here. That's, that's you know, left over when they're there. running Rumford and Nury and what have you. They add it to this in 1843. That becomes the town of Hanover the same year that Mason Township was named for Dr. Mason, 18, yeah. 1843. Yeah. Do we know what percentage of the current population can trace there? Ooh, <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Right. I have no idea. Okay, Stan, Randy. Uh, you'll want to visit our research library. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great like question, and we'd love to have you that. <laughs> there's there's got to be. I mean, there's a, certainly a, a, got to be a, a lot of a lot of family names that are still around, though. Oh yeah, there, there. Yeah, I have about a dozen. So yeah, there's about a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Talk to Stan. <laughs> yeah, but there are there are descendants here. Yeah, the descendants. Mine, mine didn't arrive till 1803. But Stanley's uh, late comers, huh? Russells were were grabbing good land very early, and. Yeah. yeah, and uh, <laughs> so Brussels and Hastings went heavy. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> Anyone else have any, any, any questions? Uh, before, before we go, I want to thank Tad very much again. This was an excellent <laughs> Do take a look at some of his books. I want to point out uh, while you're here, you have an opportunity. Our 250th anniversary quilt, made by Donna Gillis, who was right in the back of the room, is here. The squares are now disappearing fast. So if you would like your name on a square, uh, they're $20 a piece. This is a fundraiser to preserve our textile collection. And Donna will, will add your name or the name of a loved one or a favorite pet or favorite saying, or what have you, and once they're gone, they're gone. So this is an opportunity for you to become uh, part of history. The other thing I forgot to mention, Stanley, my apologies to Stanley, uh, the trustees voted many years ago that once a year to honor Stan uh, for his many years as executive director here at the Society, we would have uh, a prominent speaker, a major speaker here, to give the Stanley Russell Howe lecture, and that is what you have heard uh, today, and it's in honor of Stan, it is not in memory of Stan.